Lee Grant and Arissa is with the Prince William Sound Science Center. We've been doing this Tuesday night talk for since 99 or something. We, mm -hmm. Science Center, Sea Grant. And tonight we got Dr. Peter Wesley from UAF. He was here for other meetings. He's a professor in the College of Fisheries and Ocean Science is. So he agreed to give us a Tuesday night talk tonight. So, Dr. Wesley, cheers. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for the, the invite and for coming out on a... Um, such an awful night, is it today? I thought it rained in Cordova, but I think that's all lies. Tomorrow, just wait till tomorrow. All right, always tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah fair enough. Podcast. It's hard to be in a rainforest without rain. So anyway, what I wanted to do tonight was, um, let me start my stopwatch to get a sense of what time we're at. But what I wanted to do tonight was have a conversation a bit and take this topic about strain in Pacific salmon, which I would guess many of you sort of come to this topic thinking about as it relates to, rightly so, things like fisheries interactions and wild fish and hatchery wild fish interactions on those things, which clearly it's really vital in those sort of interactions. But what I want to do today is sort of step back a little bit and think about this, this life history trait as a biological phenomenon. And sort of my training as an evolutionary ecologist, so I study sort of the interaction between ecology and evolution, how the environment shapes traits, was that I think about homing and strain as this really important life history traits that have these consequences that are really important. And so we will talk about and hit on the issues of homing and strain in the context of hatchery and wild, but I want to spend most of the talk sort of thinking about this as a really important biological phenomenon. And in fact, I want to place homing and strain in what I would say are the three key themes that everyone, certainly all Alaskans, have to know about salmon. So it's like physicists talk about a couple of key laws that explain everything in nature. And I would say if you can ex understand these key themes in salmon, you will understand everything in salmon. Okay? So the first one, and this is going to be familiar to us, is that they are anadromous, or they exhibit anadromy. So they're born in freshwater, spend most of their time in the ocean where they obtain most of their growth, and then they come back and they spawn in freshwater. That's anadromy. And the consequences of this, ecologically and for management and other kinds of things, is that those fish obtain large body sizes, they grow really fast, and populations can have really high spawning densities because you get out of small streams that have habitat capacity limitations, you go to the big ocean pasture, and you can have really high density populations. So for each of these things, there's these consequences. And then on the flip side, the yin and yang of all these things is that there's an exception. So in salmonids, in some species and in some populations of species, not all individuals go to the ocean. So you think steelhead and rainbow trout, same species, but steelhead go to the ocean, rainbow trout do not. Kokanee, the landlocked, non-anadromous form of sockeye, so there's these exceptions in some cases. So that's our first one, is anadromy. The second one, and this we're gonna spend most of our time talking about, is homing. So after a fish is in the ocean for a period of time, they come back to spawn. They don't just go anywhere, and this is super fascinating. They don't just pick any old stream, even though there's lots of streams to pick from. They return to their natal site to breed, okay? So the consequence of that is that across this patchwork of available sites, that these populations tend to interbreed with their own group, and it leads to the evolution of these discrete populations across this landscape, which means for us as people, it requires more complex management, right? Because not all populations are the same. Diversity is important. We accept that. We know that. So it means we have to manage differently than if they just go willy-nilly anywhere. And then the flip side of homing, the other side of that coin, is that not all individuals home. Some stray, okay? And we're going to talk a lot about that. And then the third one is after they come back home, they reproduce, the species we're talking about, all of them undergo that transition, they spawn, they have one bout of reproduction, they spawn and they die, which is said that they are semilparous, or they exhibit semilparity, it's a fancy term, which means there's death after one bout of reproduction, okay? So some of the consequences of this is that they are really productive. So salmon, when it comes to the numbers of kids that a spawner has, is really high compared to things like a cod or a rockfish. These are really highly productive populations. So like in Bristol Bay, you can harvest populations at 70%, 80%, some years higher. They're really productive populations. And just to be 
linked to the POM, right? And the, the consequence of that is that they return marine-derived nutrients that are accumulated in the ocean, swim those nutrients back upstream against the gradient in which the streams are pumping these nutrients off the landscape back to the ocean, and deposit those nutrients in freshwater. That's one of the ecological consequences of semal parity. And then the flip side of that is what we would call iteroparity, and there are species, again, like uh, rainbow trout, steelhead, that have the potential to spawn multiple times. <coughs> okay? So these are the key, three key themes. So maybe if you understand anything from the talk, you think about how these themes are important. You understand a lot about salmon, and we're going to focus, oops, sorry. Oh my gosh. There we go. We're going to focus on that middle one. Okay? The importance of thinking about homing and its other cousin, the other side of the coin, thinking about straying. Okay? All right, so what I wanted to do today was step back and also say, was well, like, well, how do we know that salmon home? So we take that as a given. We've arrived at 2019, so we know that salmon do home, but how have we gotten here? How do we know that salmon home? And then asking the question I think is interesting is, well, why ought they home? Why do they home? Okay, so we look at some of those, those things. And then you ask the question, too, of, well, given that they do it, how do they manage to do it? And then flip the coin over and say, well, why do salmon stray? And think about some of those things. Then I want to spend a little bit of time, sort of highlight some emerging insights, some work that I've done, um, and then lead us into this conversation thinking about strain conservation in this context of this biological phenomenon that is mediating the interactions between hatchery and wild fish. Okay? So that's sort of where we're headed. How much time do we have? Four, five hours? As much time as we have. Okay, okay. Say you're So when, when, when more than half the crowd falls asleep, I know I, I will be done. Okay. All right. So we'll so start here. So how do we know that salmon home? So first what we have to do is give credit to the first astute naturalists. So we're going to go back to 1653. This is the complete angler, Isaac Walton, writing about his buddy Francis Bacon. So if you read this here, it essentially it talks about an early marking study. So they're sitting at the weir, and he says, by tying a ribbon of some known taper thread to the tail of some young salmons, which have been taken in weirs, as they swimmeth toward the salt water, and by taking a part of them again with the known mark at the same place that they returned from the sea, has inclined many to think that every salmon usually returns to the same river in which it was bred. Right? So they literally tied ribbons around the tails of these little fish. They swam out to the ocean for a while, and then they came back. It's a little bit disconcerting to think about how advanced our techniques have gotten since then, right? It's a little bit fancier, but, but not a whole lot different, okay? So that's some fairly convincing evidence that you tag some fish in a small river and they come back home. You can fast forward a bit. This is Milner, a classic fisheries biologist writing about shad. It's another anadromous fish. And it noted that in some markets and other things that there were traits that seem to lead him to believe that there's a generally accepted fact that anadromous fishes are disposed to return to almost the exact locality where they passed their earlier stages of growth. And some of his evidence of this was that these fish differ in some of these traits, some fancy word like physiognomy, which is just a fancy word for morphology and other things. But the suggestion is natural that they, these groups are distinct and separate colonies of the same species and slight characteristics are perpetuated because they breed in and in, right? And do not mix with those of other rivers. Those traits accumulate in those local sites because individuals that have those traits tend to breed with individuals that have those traits and don't mix as much with individuals with different traits. So there's 1876. That's fairly astute observation. Fast forward a bit. We need to go to Willis Rich. This is some quite fascinating stuff. So writing in 1939, also another famous... Uh, fisheries biologist who says that there's diverse evidence points so clearly to the existence of local self-perpetuating populations in Pacific salmon that any hypothesis that does not conform must be subject to considerable doubt. Okay? So that homing leads to these discrete populations is essentially a nice way of saying that if you go out and do a study and you don't find evidence that suggests that we have these local populations, you probably have done something wrong, right? That the evidence is so compelling. Okay? So let's shift gears, so that's sort of some observational work. Let's shift to think about some early experiments. And this is kind of a cool experiment. So this is from the Fraser River. So orient you here, so you know, uh, uh, Vancouver is down here, Seattle is down here, it's Fraser River that drains. And we're gonna go way down here, the star is at this place called Cultus Lake. Okay, so we're gonna do an experiment here. 
And the point of what they did, their approach, was and to ask the question, essentially, is, you know, are the adults that enter this river, are those the same ones that had left a couple years earlier? So how could we do this? We could pull a Francis Bacon or Isaac Walton, and we're going to tag some of those smolts, and then we're going to wait for them to return and see how many of those fish have those marks coming back. And the hypothesis would be is that most fish would be marked. If homing was occurring, most of those fish would be marked, right? despite the fact that cultus is way down near the bottom of the watershed, and there are massive populations that all have to swim past to go up this river. So if the other populations were just going willy-nilly, it's going to completely inundate any of those marks. There's no way you would see those marked fish, because those other populations are going to be swarming in. That make sense? OK, so what did they do? So this data from Forrester, published in 36, from an earlier season, so in the 1931, and then in 36, they went out and they marked a whole bunch of smolts. So literally by hand, clipping 365,000 or so smolts in the fall, right? They did it here. In the fall, they start returning, the obvious major age classes that return. Large fish and small fish, presumably different age classes. Of these, 2,856 were marked, and only 17 or 0.6% were unmarked, OK? And so the consequence of this is, well, maybe these were missed by them or something else, or maybe those were strays from somewhere else that came in. These other ones that are unmarked were presumably of a different cohort, a different age. Okay? So if that wasn't convincing, if, for me, if I did that study, I'd be like, sweet, I'm going to stop, because that's pretty convincing to me. <laughs> they did it again, tagged more fish, and found a very similar strong evidence that, yes, most fish that leave Coltis Lake come back to Coltis Lake. But they got much more in the way of the smaller fish that year. It's about half the size. No, yes. Yeah, so some differences, but when you look at the total clips per mark, the chances of having so many clip fish is clearly consistent with the idea that homing is occurring. OK, onward. But there's always skeptics. So this is one of my favorite skeptics. Anyone heard of Archie Huntsman? Yeah. Archie, good old Archie. So he's most famous for essentially contributing to the refrigeration of factory trawlers of cod, and probably in part contributed to the collapse of one of the greatest fisheries on Earth. But aside, Archie was a serious skeptic. And so he thought that salmon that go to sea probably never go very far. And those that are on the high seas are undoubtedly lost. And so he was only going to be convinced. So he thought he was a clever guy. He said, I'm only going to be convinced when a fish is tagged in a home river, that same fish is caught in the ocean, and then is released, and then recovered again in the home river. So that's never going to happen. So he was pretty convinced he was going to have it. <laughs> 1942, serious humble pie, right? So an Atlantic salmon was tagged off Cape Breton, was captured sort of east of Newfoundland, right? And then it returned home. Now he was also a skeptic about aging fish with uh, in scales. Bingo. Yeah. Skep on that, on skepticism that has a hearty place in science, and then you quickly show that he was wrong. <laughs> That's okay. But there's, those, that has an important argument. That's a very convincing case, right, of clearly that fish is not lost at sea and can come home. Okay? All right. So I think this leads us, and we're going to fast forward a little bit, this leads us to a fascinating question of, okay, so given that fish home, to what spatial scale do fish home? If they get home to a whole watershed, that's cool. But what about parts within a river? To what spatial scale do fish home? So this is a really cool study. I don't know if anyone knows Tom Quinn. He's a professor at the University of Washington. He's written a, written a few papers on salmon. Um, this is his son, Brian, from a few years back standing in Hanson Creek. So that's representative of Hanson Creek. Sort of bar <laughs> barely get your feet wet. You can jump across it. A blind bear can eat fish in that creek. <laughs> Okay? So it's a small site, but it's really conducive to doing some studies. And what they did was they took fish, and there are fish that spawn in the main stem of the creek, and there's fish that branch off and spawn in this groundwater pond. Okay? And so what they did, and they wanted to ask the question of, fish that are spawned in that groundwater pond, do they tend to home back to that groundwater pond, or do they go willy-nilly within the creek? Right? And this is I'll put again on these spatial scales, right? That's one kilometer. This is a dinky little creek. Okay? So what are the odds that fish that are spawned in the pond 
would actually make it back to the pond. So how do you do this? Okay, well, it's pretty cool. So there's a picture of pond. My friend Keith sort of walking towards the outlet. The rest of the creek is sort of over in here in the, all, in the spruces. Okay, so what they did was they went, grabbed some fish, artificially spawned them. Maybe some people have heard of this. There's a thing called thermal otolith marking. Anyone? We do it to all the fish here. Okay, <laughs> joke inside. Sarcasm. Anyway, so anyway, so they used these otolith marks, right? Planted those eyed embryos back into the creek, right? And then waited for those fish to hatch out, go to sea, and then looked four years later to look to see how many of those adult marks in the pond were marked with otoliths. And you, you can use some Bayesian analysis and say, what is the probability of finding these marks in the creek versus the lake? How many do you need to, in, in order to have a pretty convincing element that it's not chance alone that those marks came back to the pond? Okay, so you can do that, that modeling and those statistics correctly. And lo and behold, the numbers may not be shocking to you, but by chance, this is way out, out of chance alone, that when you look into the pond, they looked at 324 fish, 12 of those were actually marked and zero of the 134 fish that were looked randomly in the creek were marked. And again, if you do those comparisons to chance alone, that's very, very unlikely that those marks would have ended up in the pond if they hadn't been homing to the pond, okay? So more fish did return to the pond that would have occurred by chance, and so this is suggesting that they have the capacity to home at these really fine scales. Okay. And those guys are spawning all at the same time, right? They do spawn. They're, they're, if there's any differences in spawning timing, it's uber, uber subtle. Okay. Uber subtle. One of the fascinating things, oh, you're going to send me down a rabbit hole, but one of the fascinating <laughs> things is the pond, the probability of being whacked by a bear and not spawning, not, not having a chance to spawn, um, is way lower if you make it to the pond. So the consequences, the fitness consequences of homing to the creek or the pond potentially could be quite different. You're safer if you make it into a pond. You're harder to be caught by a bear if you make it into the pond. So clearly, I just want to say this too, is that clearly at some point, the capacity to home at these really fine scales has to give way to habitat selection and competition. And at some point too, you'd figure that kin selection or kin unselection is going to lead to individuals getting pushed away. I mean, if you have offspring coming back to essentially the site of the reds, that could cause a problem. So at some point, there's going to be behavior and fine scale things that's going to essentially take over and drive sort of habitat selection. But I think this is evidence, and other papers suggest it, that individuals can, in some places, really um, home to very small uh, scales, particularly with parts of rivers, or in this case, like a off so off pond off the side of a, of a creek. OK? So hopefully you're convinced. Salmon can home. You're with me? Okay. So they you know. So it's an interesting question, I think. Well, why, why do they? Why ought they do this? And I actually really like this map, and I pose this as, yes, this is the Yukon. I know we're in Cordova, but I live sort of right there, in the middle of this side on the lateral line, right? So the idea that I put this up here is, you know, some of these Chinook are not only swimming across borders, but a Chinook that is spawned in the Teslin swims past all of these other Chinook-bearing rivers and swims thousands of miles up this river, essentially turning its fin up at all these other rivers that clearly are totally viable Chinook salmon spawning streams, right? So why should a fish swim that far in order to get to that site when clearly there are other rivers that are conducive to salmon spawning? So it's an interesting question to think about it that way. And I often pose that to students and they scratch their heads and get worried because they think it's all a house of cards and don't understand. Okay? So we can start thinking about these things, these behaviors, you can break them apart and thinking about behaviors as being what are so-called sort of explained by these proximate mechanisms or these ultimate mechanisms. And don't worry, I'm not going to go down the weeds too far. But you can ask things like whether homing, you can ask her what are the mechanisms behind it? actually the hardware, the underlying mechanisms behind it. You can ask questions about how it develops through, through ontogeny or development of an organism. And then you could flip that and say, well, what are some of the ultimate drivers of this? This is sort of the big F fitness type question. What's the significance of this? How does it increase survival or success by doing it? Or you could also ask questions of how did it evolve among closely related groups? So what's the phylogeny behind that behavior? My point is when you ask these types of questions, there's different angles you can take to say, well, why does this happen? So there's lots of different ways we can approach this.
So will some of the ultimate exclamations, thinking about fitness and so forth, is that homing allows individuals to return to appropriate habitats, which is to say locally adapted individuals that have traits that allow them to do well in those habitats, if they home back to them, allows them to do well in those habitats. So it means is, you know, a large deep-bodied big Chinook salmon that spawns in a main stem of a glacial river like the Kenai probably does better there than it would if it went into a small tributary somewhere else. It has traits that allows it to do well there. Homing <coughs> also increases the probability of individuals finding a mate. So its parents spawn there, they had a mate. So if it returns there, the odds are perhaps it will also find a mate. Right? So there could be a fitness advantage to that. You could argue that it reduces the cost of maybe looking for other suitable streams. So the idea is that even if you were spawned a thousand miles up the Yukon, having the, essentially the memory that that site will be conducive takes out of the equation the time to maybe poke in and look at other sites. Okay? So it might reduce the cost and maybe some of those, those issues of searching for available habitat. And then for species that are interoparous, so these are not the ones that die after spawning, it could familiarize individuals with habitat. Okay? So you return multiple times to a habitat and you get used to it. Okay? Those are some ideas. And these are some ideas that are posed in these review papers. Okay? All right. What about the proximate explanations? And we're going to head towards a proximate explanation that I think most of you are probably familiar for. And that the proximate explanation could be that salmon imprint to site-specific odors during this juvenile period, and that they can recall these odors as adults to, use, to find their way home. That's an explanation. They smell their way home. That's, how, that's why they do it. Okay? So it takes us to this uh, classic uh, hypothesis posed by Hassler and Wisby in 1954. So what it poses is forms what's called the olfaction or olfactory hypothesis, and it's got four components. Okay? So the first is that rivers differ in a whole suite of sort of chemicals. So there's differences of rocks and soils and plants. And in the last few years, it's increasingly clear that actually the amino acid profiles within rivers serve as odorants that can be detected by salmon and can be used for imprinting and for homing. Okay, so the rivers differ in those things. Those differences are stable over seasons and years. So this creek consistently smells different than this creek. Salmon can learn those odors, and salmon are attracted to those learned odors at maturity. So those four things have to be operating in this, this hypothesis. Okay? And what's also really cool when we look at another sort of machinery of how they do this, they, salmon, have the hardware in order to detect these odors. So this is a picture of a chingacoho I caught. Forget the pink thing hanging out of its mouth, but it's sort of a nice close-up of its nares, its nose. So water funnels in through that and flushes over. This is a scanning micron uh, image of the factory old zet. So these are sort of lamellae and cells that are incredibly tuned to the detection of different chemicals and odorants. Okay? So they have incredible sort of hardware in order to detect these different chemicals in the water. So they're well attuned to do this. And so this takes us to, I think, also some really fascinating sort of experimental work. So again, if you have this, this hypothesis, it allows a perfect setup to test some of these things. This was Alan Scholes's PhD, um, published in Science. So again, to any of my PhD students, I said, well, if you think you did good work, you should check this one out. Okay? So what he did, which was pretty cool, was he used coho salmon that had been introduced to Lake Michigan, okay? and that he took fish and either exposed some of those fish to one of either two artificial odors. So these are compounds that you could put into the water that are distinct from anything in nature, and they could imprint to those compounds. Okay? And then, of course, he used some controls, and then he released the smolts into the lake. Okay? And then at maturity, those fish started presumably coming back to look, and then he then dribbled those odors into different streams and these fish had no experience from these streams. That's another part, right? They were released into Lake, Lake Michigan, had no idea, and then essentially tried to lure those fish back into those streams where they, their odorants had been dribbled. Does that make sense? Okay. So you pose a question of, well, which streams did those adults ascend? Okay. So there again, this is the setup. So you have some no, so you have control sites with no order. You have these things called morpholine. So it's an inner chemical. Phenyl ethyl alcohol is another one. So you get the idea, 
So you would probably predict that if they are using olfaction to home, a PEA exposed group would likely come back to the PEA river, and the morpholine group would come back to the morpholine river, right? If they're smelling their way home, right? Wait for it, wait for it, okay. This is where I usually pause and make students interpret the outcome, okay? So what are we looking at here? Percent from each trial group at the recovery site. This is the morpholine group in the morpholine river. 96% of the fish captured there from the morpholine group were in the morpholine river. That's fairly convincing. What about the PEA? 92% of the PEA group were in the PEA river. That seems pretty convincing to me. Other release sites had a few fish, right? Other release sites. And these are the controls, and the controls are going to essentially a hodgepodge of certain sites. But also points to that, for whatever reason, the controls seem to like that river more than that river. Okay? Convinced? Yes? I was fairly so convinced. Possibly the controls were following the fish that were that knew where they were going. Because One idea, what's his or, his, uh, or a little Manawak yeah. is a big river, it's a cold river, it's a closer to the release site, there's a whole lot of hypotheses you could say. There's what a makes following that. hypothesis for strain that, what's his face, the guy that wrote the pink salmon chapter in the Canadian oh, book. Heard. Yeah. Yeah. So that, maybe they follow these guys, you know, they just there's, weren't sure where they're supposed to go. There's some, there's there's some crazy <laughs> people talking about collective social stuff yeah. right now, that's right. We'll, we'll, we'll hit on that some coming up. Okay, so a conclusion. So salmon can use these olfactory cues to home. And it also suggested from this study that imprinting to those home orders can occur during that par smolt transformation stage. That's when they expose those individuals to those cues, right, as they were getting ready to smolt and they let them out the door. So that's really important information. This study then led people to start digging down and fairly quickly made people ask this question and made people realize that, well, Clearly, imprinting doesn't only happen at that stage. So you take species like sockeye salmon that are spawned in these small tributaries. The fry move downstream into a larger river or to a lake. They then smolt from that lake, right, go to the ocean, but they don't come back to the lake where they smolted. They come back to where they were a small fry in the gravel in those streams. So clearly, there must have been some imprinting earlier on in that migration migratory uh, part, pattern of the life history. Which then led to this question of, well, clearly there must be other common phases of life history in which imprinting can occur. It's suggested that it's happening at the embryonic stage or the early life history stages, and it poses this question that's not totally worked out, but where and when do they imprint on these home orders? Okay, it's led to sort of a refined hypothesis, thinking about the pattern of imprinting. It's led to what's called the sequential imprinting hypothesis. And without digging too deep into the, into the, uh, the patterns of this, I'll try to walk through it a little bit. But it goes something like, in the spring, there are changes in the internal hardware of chemicals that are associated with imprinting. In this case, it's this T4 plasma protein that is changing in the fish and you get these spikes in the different stages, but there's some spikes in this that are occurring before the part of smolt transformation, like when they are embryos or fry. And so changes in the season leads to the changes in T4 that leads to that elevated thyroxin, which is that T4. And then we know that the increase of thyroxin leads to actually the propensity of the nose and the cells to increase their ability to learn odors. This is all tested in the lab. Right, So season length changes, thyroxine goes up, individuals start having the ability to learn odors more. That also leads to a tendency to migrate. Mm -hmm. So literally, they start getting itchy and wanting to go. By migrating, you are likely to start bumping into new odors. By bumping into new odors, we know that that feeds back on giving you a bump in thyroxine, which leads you to learn more odors that feeds back on that loop. And so the idea is that this is a way in which this is a conceptual model that has a basis in labs and other studies to say this is how sort of waypoints sequentially get laid down as individuals are working their way through a river system. Right? The, uh, the first two pigs might have to do that when they hatch and when Bingo. they emerge. Bingo. 
because yep. sometimes they'll go down in the yep. gravel and so they have to start moving. Yep. And this is a bit of a cartoon, but this is um, based on real lab data. Okay? So it's a conceptual model, but you get this idea that fish are laying down a sequential map of these waypoints as they're working their way through a river network. And obviously this has more consequences for fish that are working their way through the Fraser River, or the Yukon, or the Columbia compared to a fish that's coming off the intertidal area. But this is just part of the biology that's inherent in these, in these species. Okay? And there's some evidence for this. And some of our evidence comes from the ways that humans actually disrupt this process. So things have gotten so bad in the Sacramento and the San Joaquin, so the Central Valley of California, that to offset the really painfully low survival of fish that are migrating through the delta, particularly I mean, fish are getting sucked into pumps where water is being used for irrigation and incredible predation by introduced smallmouth or uh, striped bass, that fish from hatcheries are put onto trucks and they truck them downstream and dump them essentially in the estuary of the river. And what this is showing is that the further you truck fish from their site, the more strain goes up. Okay? To essentially, if you move them from up here, right, at Coleman, where it's a big one, and you move them all the way down, that you've disrupted the entire period of their map within that river to get home, and they don't know how to get home, so they functionally all stray. Okay. So, oh, sorry. This is some work I did with my friend Morgan. Um, we were both doing postdocs at the same time. So this is the, from the Columbia River. So we asked a similar question about transport. So in the Columbia River, they do a similar thing, load up fish on these barges, move them downstream in the Columbia River. And in these barges, though, actually, they're site circulating water. So it's not like they don't experience any changes in water, but they're sort of working their way down, not migrating naturally. And we asked the question of whether fish that are transported versus migrate on their own have different patterns of strain. Okay, so we quantified this for different hatcheries. These are fish that temporarily dipped into a non-natal site but then managed to go home versus those that are permanently lost from their local population. And all told, transport has a really big effect. So transported fish somewhere around 14 times were more likely to stray than fish that migrated naturally. Okay? But I would also point out, these are stray rates. So even transported fish that are moved a long distance downstream, right? So even a high stray rate is 10%, or on these, the permanent strays are pretty low. Individuals are able to piece together big portions of that lost gap in migration, right? So if they're allowed to start migrating some, picked up on a barge, moved downstream, they're actually able to sort of make up a big gap in that sequential process, but overall clearly disrupting that process of sequential imprinting seems like it comes at a cost of homing and increases strain. Peter? So yeah? In that, that previous slide um, where they were tanked down to the estuary, mm -hmm. wait, is that just where they were returning to the estuary or they were going further up and straight? They go places? further up. Yeah. One of the sites here, it's the American. This is going to lead on, we're going to have some conversation about this, but not in depth. Clearly, some rivers are more attractive to strays than others. A lot of these fish end up in the American River for reasons that are not obvious to me or the researchers. Hmm. But has consequences for the local breeding American the, River stock. Is yeah. the overall stock in the American in pretty good shape? No. Oh, it is. I mean, not. I mean, not so, and the, these are almost all um, fall ocean type Chinook, Chinook so salmon. fall fall Chinook salmon. So they're not necessarily so, following a big mass. I don't think it's that simple. Not that simple. Okay, so we're gonna we're start working our way down this rabbit hole. So ask this question, flip it a little bit, and say, okay, so fish obviously home. We got this idea of why they home. So we'll flip it and say, well, why do fish stray? Is an important one. Well, some ultimate explanations for straying is that it allows the recolonization of new habitats. Right. So salmon have evolved in incredibly variable, changing environments. So it allows individuals to recolonize those environments when things change, so it buffers against habitat variability. Okay, I'm going to show some pictures of this, but you can imagine fish that are spawned in a small tributary and it gets blocked by a landslide or a volcano. Or a volcano. We're going to show a picture of that. Only the individuals that stray those years are going to have much success, so it buffers against that. And again, 
strain um, may return individuals back to where they are well suited. So the idea is if certain individuals have traits that by chance allow them to do better somewhere else, maybe they're better off strain. Okay? Okay. So let's dive down a little bit on this, thinking about colonization by strays, right? So if we back up 10,000 years ago or so, where are we here somewhere? Yeah. We were covered in ice, more or less, right? So the patterns of diversity that we have seen in large parts of Alaska for salmon have evolved over a fairly short period of time with the retreat of these glaciers. And all of these populations, in some time scale, exist now because they were colonized by strays. Right? Salmon are, well, there's some evidence at least um, that salmon are slowly working their way northward and might be starting to colonize streams on rivers that are draining into the north, uh, into the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas, and that is a process that is necessarily going to be mediated by, by strain. There are not established local populations of salmon on the north slope in any sizable numbers. Okay? It also allows this recolonization after things like habitat restoration. So there's a picture of the currently largest dam removal project in North America. This is on the Elwha. This is Glines Canyon. This is in 2012. So still removing the dams just give you some scale to how large this dam was. They were, uh, there was like an ICU at the mouth of the river that had a hatchery for Chinook salmon. Yeah. The other thing is whether the... Uh, Rainbow trout were actually steelhead that just reverted back to non anadromy and then basically so, shaded the river afterwards. So, well, this, so, the, okay, so this is a picture I took. So, there was individuals that were keeping track of the recolonization of steelhead. So, these are anadromous rainbow trout that were working their way up above the former dam sites. Do they have DNA from before the uh, uh, removal? It's of the both. Dam? So there's, yeah, both, there's, both, there's both evidence of re-expression of anadromous life histories of resident individuals, including of bull trout and kokanee. All right. Um, and the colonization by anadromous individuals. So it's a double whammy. Okay. So it allows the recolonization and the flexibility in the life history to re-express some of those things when the environment allows. Um, but these individuals were definitely colonizing on their own. Okay. And then they have this, right? So talk about buffering against change. So, 1980, eruption of Mount St. Helens. That's total scorched earth for any individual that was spawning in the Tootle River or the East Fork of the Lewis. It's the only right. river in the, in the, going up to Columbia that was not dammed. It got wiped out by the volcano. Yeah, the poor Tootle. <laughs> but, lo and behold. It's a big irony there. So, all of the fish that were in the Tootle River or incubating in the gravel that year were totally nuked. Stray rates went way up in the few years after this from the Tootle River to other sites. That was well documented. It was well documented that individuals would avoid volcanic ash. They don't like it. They would go somewhere else. But lo and behold, it didn't take too long for the Tootle River to puke back to life. And it was recolonized, <laughs> recolonized by, by strays and probably some of the individuals that had held on and strayed to other systems and maybe eventually came back home. Okay. So that's an ex a dramatic example. There's other things like the bypassing of really tough migratory things. So this is the pinch point on the Fraser River called Hell's Gate for good reason. So the entire flow of the Fraser comes pinching past this area. It was always a really, really tough migratory bottleneck for fish. And then it was made worse in the <laughs> 1920s. They were building a road, created a landslide, yeah, railroad. railroad up here, pinched it in. And so until these fish ladders were built, there's a slot here. So based on the flow of the water, fish can get into this slot and swim up and around. That there were no pink salmon above Hell's Gate for decades. Fish ladder was introduced, and lo and behold, pink salmon began colonizing, exponential growth, and now pink salmon are abundant again above Hell's Gate. Recolonized. Sockeye did a lot better getting past so even the Adams River, some of those Shuswap groups were actually able to get past. The swimming capacity of pinks really put them at a disadvantage. Because of the hunt, maybe? I think just because of their smaller body size, swimming capacity, something. Yeah. Okay. Um, this one is, a, is interesting. So strain, there's some evidence that individuals that stray at fine spatial scales might have traits that allow them to do well in other environments besides their home environment. So this is work 
Jocelyn Lynn, she was a PhD at the University of Washington, working on these cute little streams. There's a small stream in Bristol Bay. You can see some honeycombing patterns where fish are spawning in the beach adjacent to the creek. So you get these creek spawning Humpty Dumpty big boys in the lake, where presumably, you know, the girls like the guys with the big humps, but you know, the bears can't get those because if a big guy goes into the creek, the bears munch the ones with the big humps and you end up with fish that are small and skinny in the creek. And so what Jocelyn did with pedigree type analyses that are similar to a, sort of the current uh, Big Hatchery Wild project that's going on, Jocelyn was able to show that small individuals from the beach population were the ones that actually would stray from the beach into the creek. So essentially it's by chance beach fish actually didn't have big humps where they might not have done as well in their home environment those strays actually might have done better by going to the creek, okay? So in that case, actually straying might have come at an advantage to some of those individuals. Where did it go? Okay, uh, here. All right, so proximate exclamations. So these are some other things, right? So those were the big picture ideas. But you might say, well, maybe individuals stray because they've forgotten what home smells like. Maybe they're not very, their noses don't work very well. There's sensory failure. Maybe the river has changed, right? The chemical bouquet, maybe that river had changed. Maybe the fish get tired, like I've swam far enough and I'm done, I'm gonna go here, okay? Maybe there's some decision to stray and there's work increasingly working on this that think about this trade-off between homing and spawning site selection. So this idea of um, sensory or memory failure, there might be something to this. this is a, some old data that Tom Quinn first published in the good old days. This pattern has been shown over and over in these types of studies that the percent of strain, particularly in Chinook and Steelhead, really goes up with age, where the older fish tend to stray more than the younger fish. Okay? So maybe you're old and you just forget what home smells like, or maybe home has actually changed more in five years than it did in two or three years. Okay? But as a general pattern, we see is that it seems that the that older fish... the real monster fish are more likely to be stray. Huh? That's the probability of strain tends to go up with age. Hmm. Interesting. Yep. Okay. All right. And then there's a, some other recent evidence where that's actually suggesting that there's some... I don't say. Fish are not thinking these things through, but there's some decision to stray, actually. So this is Daniel Peterson's... Masters, again, this creek, so these little creeks and beaches. And so what he essentially showed was that, cr that strays that were in these creeks actually spent some time in their other creek, in their home creek, and then became strays, okay? So it's essentially saying that, you know, it's not like they were totally lost and never found home. It seemed like there was some decision such that whatever the conditions were in that site or whatever, Maybe they went somewhere else. Um, but it also does not take into account that perhaps they didn't recognize their home stream as home. It's hard to know. But it's not consistent with this idea that there's just sort of sensory failure and they couldn't get home because strays actually spent some time at home before they strayed. Okay? All right. So I'm, I'm hitting you guys with a lot. How are we doing on timing? You got a lot. Are you sure I got a lot? <laughs> no, no, not a lot. <laughs> All right, where are we on some emerging insights? Uh, 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 um. How are we doing on energy? Are we good? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. All right, all right, okay. So some emerging insights. Um, so some of the things that we've learned recently, there's actually been a wealth of information we've learned from these really miraculous little chunks of magnetized wire, coded wire tags that are coded and have been inserted into millions of small fish from places like the Columbia River and elsewhere. And for a lot of the work I've done during my postdoc and other things, I essentially tapped into these big data sets that have been used primarily to get at things like survival rates and distribution in the ocean, which is all awesome, but it hadn't been used as much to get at homing and strain. So I really sort of tapped into those. So one of the things that I asked were things like, well, you know, this seems like a really basic question, but to what extent do different species or life histories within species differ in stray rate? 
So I went to the Columbia, and in the Columbia, there's lots of different hatchery programs, and so what I did was look for hatchery programs that had different species or life history types of species released into that hatchery program, and then calculated stray rates. So in this case for Chinook, there's the so-called stream type life history, which is a fancy way of saying that juveniles migrate to the ocean in their first year of life, or after one full year in freshwater versus ocean type fish that go essentially in their first summer of life. Okay, so that's all that really means in some ways. But what it shows is consistently in these sites, these three sites, that these ocean type fish strayed way higher than the stream type fish. And that was really consistent. Okay? And what was unique about this study is it controlled for all other things that other studies hadn't. So it's like same fish released in the same river in the same year, all else being equal, different life history types. And you see these patterns. And you also see this intriguing pattern, I think, of not only do you have differences in life histories, but certain streams tend to produce more strays of both types. For whatever reason, the Kalama hatchery had more than the cowlitz, which was low for both, and then the phallic. And there's, in this case, with three data points, yes, but there's some association between sites doing something different. So whether it is the hatchery program, that there's something going on in the hatchery, or there's just something different in those rivers, it's hard to know. But in this case, it's suggesting that there's really clear differences also in the rivers or populations with extent to stray. Not all populations stray at the same rate. So you have differences in species. Take my word, this is within a species. But differences across species, differences within species, differences in populations. There's lots of really fascinating variation in strain. The other thing is pink salmon and junk salmon are more or less like the ocean type of Chinook salmon. So. I think so, although the amount of straying data I've seen on pink salmon is pretty limited. Yeah, and when you, well, <laughs> yeah, but it's also, these are, let's, so these are also, um, it's 20%, man. so these are 20% of the fish that were released from the Cowlitz River went somewhere else. This is not 20% of the fish that are in the Cowlitz are comprised by fish from elsewhere. These are so-called sort of donor rates of strain. These are the, the strain out, mm -hmm. okay? We're gonna look a little bit, and I think our framework in Alaska is actually a different form of strain when we talk about it. It's what fraction of a wild pond spawning ground are comprised by strays. So it's a little bit different. So, so the they're study- trying to, is, They're trying to account for all the fish and trying to actually come up with that number that you came up with there. The donor rate? Yeah, in the at, strain project that at, we're yeah, doing right now. At the Prince William Sound level, there's an estimate. Yeah. Um, so that that the any, other estimate, the BAM, there's a BAM right. study early estimate that has yeah. an estimate of donor rates of strain that's more like 5%. Yeah, that's, right? That's not that's really exceedingly low. high. I think, I think pink salmon get a bad Heard rap. Heard said 10% in his chapter. Sure, 10%. When I asked him about that, he says, don't, but, don't so much, believe it. Yeah. <laughs> but also, 10% doesn't strike me as exceedingly high either compared to these others. So I think pink salmon get a bad rap when it comes to strain. Okay, so the other thing I did, I want to bounce through this fairly quickly. In fact, do I want to spend time with this? Anyway, um, the other thing that we, I asked was whether strain rates are also influenced by things like water temperature, okay? So all of these are different variables that I thought might influence strain, okay? And then these are the effects of that. And so, this was a big study, multiple populations of Chinook salmon in the Columbia River, and what it's suggesting here, do I have a previous one? Okay, so this. So some of the big drivers were Columbia River temperature and the local temperature of the, of the rivers in which the fish were going back to, essentially saying as the temperature goes up, they tend to stray more, okay? When the river gets warm, individuals likely start bailing out of that warm river, starting to look for somewhere else to spawn, that sort of makes sense. The other thing that emerged was this run size effect, and it was actually negative. So as the numbers go up, the rate of strain went down. That's interesting. Yeah, I thought so. But that would suggest if they are following, that would be a, that would support the following. Hold your idea of the yeah. social hypothesis. Okay. Because <laughs> it led to something. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so it led to this. So that interesting idea about numbers led to the formulation, and I'll show you some of the work, asking whether maybe salmon benefit 
from essentially this social collective navigation idea. So maybe individuals are pooling that information and that individuals actually can maximize their chance of getting home by traveling in groups. And it's interesting, I mean, clearly everyone knows, I mean, salmon don't migrate by themselves, they're in schools, they're in groups, they're social. And almost everything we've studied about homing and strain is always at the individual level, but they don't migrate as individuals. So this led to a pretty fascinating collaboration. So this is a paper um, published, came out in 2016. So myself and Andrew Birdall and others, we compiled stray rates across papers that also had escapement data. So this is the relationship that I just showed you. So that's some of the, all of the data points that I was showing you. These are other studies. And overall, if you look, there's overall there is a negative declining trend of numbers and strain rates. Okay? But the rate of strain tends to go down as the numbers go up. Okay? And so this led to us a whole series of papers. So this is my friend, collaborator, colleague, Andrew Birdall. He's now at the University of Washington. Led to a whole series of papers, and they keep coming. Um, we first talked about this in this 2016 Fish and Fisheries paper, and then we gathered a group of, of, well, smarter people than me at least, got together and talked about social collective navigation in this uh, uh, philosophical transaction special issue, where we talked about essentially this collective navigation hypothesis. So the idea is if you travel in a bigger group, you're more likely to make it home because you can pool your information by traveling with individuals that might be more informed or better navigator than you. And there's been some modeling effects that we did. So this is sort of an example of tracks of birds. They're trying to go from South America to Europe, small group, probability of making it to that destination is a lot less likely than if you're in a big group. And you can model these effects. That's why we always see birds migrating in groups. <laughs> yes, okay, so it's formalizing some of these things that might seem obvious yet some of the mechanisms behind them had not been thought about, to our knowledge, really been, certainly had not been formalized. Have the bird people uh, worked on this? <coughs> not really. Hmm. And there was a lot of bird people in our group. Lots of homing pigeons and storks and all kinds of folks. Okay, so what this also did is a fun little paper going back to Hanson Creek data. So that's that little creek that had hardly any water in it. So one of the things that's great about that is that stream had been walked every year, every fish had been sort of counted as they entered the stream, and what had been observed over many, many years is that the numbers of fish entering the stream it was spiky, right? You don't have this perfect smooth number of fish entering the creek each day. Even in this little creek where there's not a fishing effect, there's not like a precipitation where all of a sudden there's lots of water, they come in these like pulses. Okay, that's the empirical data, 30 years of stream walks. So what we did was constructed this cute little model where it just said, okay, well maybe individuals, they start staging at the mouth of the creek, we see that, and maybe individuals then, an individual goes, and then fin fish that are in that essentially staging pool have to then decide maybe they copy that behavior. And the individuals that are ready to spawn have a choice of copying or not copying, and then you have this sort of cascading choice effect. And by incorporating essentially these social dynamics into a model, we could capture and emulate the real data. If you have more males first, they're not gonna go upstream until a female shows up and starts. Well, I don't know. Up. Every year, the first fish into that creek is a male and it dies. Okay. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> dumb, dumb. <laughs> someone's gotta go first. And literally every fish that enters Hanson Creek dies every year. And it's always a male. So. But when they, when they come up in a mass, is there usually a female that they're following you hunt? You know, males tend to come first. Yeah. There's a, so that, but might, so the female may induce kind of group Perhaps, yeah. perhaps. I think what we were modeling here was literally sort of uh, reproductive readiness. So individuals are going, staging, getting ready to, right? You do not want to go into that creek if you're not ready to spawn, right? Because mm -hmm. you've got to get it done fast because the odds of surviving it through the night are low. But, but even around here, there's you know, a few pools, and you'll see the coho salmon, they're not mature yet. You'll see the males coming up to the females, and they're like trying to spawn with them while they're just pulling males, up. Males are usually, they're really they're checking ready. them out. Yeah, they're, they're ready. Or trying to get them to move upstream. Yeah. All right, so those, those are some of the emerging insights. The collective behavior stuff has been really, really fun.
fun part of my uh, research program working with, uh, with colleagues. So hopefully at this point, that was a lot of information, sorry, but uh, if we still have time, we're gonna shift a little bit and think about sort of this strain and conservation, okay? So, you know, strain as a biological phenomenon is a major conservation concern in lots of places. So there's a fascinating photo, Roger Tabor, this is a juvenile Atlantic salmon in a British Columbia River, juvenile coho salmon behind it. So clearly, there's an Atlantic salmon that escaped from a pen, made its way to a stream, at least somebody successfully spawned. spawned. Yeah. Now, I'm not that worried about it, because when you go back and look and try to find Atlantic salmon in those rivers, you don't find them. So Atlantic salmon clearly are not that great at colonizing, but the point is, that strain as a phenomenon is the way in which those escaped fish are gonna find streams. But right? the reverse is happening also. There's pink salmon invading Britain and other parts of Europe, right? Yeah, but Norway needs fish, so who's on? <laughs> right. Okay. Pink salmon? Yeah. So, it's, like it's, a, it's a gift from Russia. Okay. Um, okay, so putting this into context, people are probably familiar with this sort of pattern, right? So these are the releases of all hatchery fish from Alaska going back to essentially the start across different regions and you could break that part by pinks or chunk or whatever but you get the idea so we're now sitting somewhere above you know 1.5 billion or so released fish with most of them being in southeast mostly chum right and then this is here us in Prince William Sound mostly pinks so there's a lot of fish okay so the concerns <laughs> about this are not new so this was a fascinating one, actually getting ready for this talk. I revisited this Sea Grant report, if you're interested, from Cordova. He used to work here, by 1976. The way. So people were clearly talking about this not that long ago. And so Jack Kelly was of the opinion and wrote in this first proceedings, Sea Grant proceeding, by the way, <laughs> um, which has a place. But so he was of the opinion, you know, that wild populations of salmon, they maintain their adaptive genetic diversity through natural selection and spawning behavior. And he is claiming that any form of artificial propagation that increases survival or reduction of natural mortality at any stage will change the genetic composition of the original stock. Okay? So this is from a while ago, but people were, were asking these questions and had these concerns. Okay? Well, so what? So I put this more in just so what, okay? Um, so the idea is that there are traits that are favored in hatcheries that might be detrimental in the wild. What are those traits? Things like behavioral traits, where individuals might do well in the hatchery with certain traits, but those traits might not do well in the wild. So the concern is that the interbreeding of those hatchery fish and wild fish might reduce the long-term viability of those populations. And that's all the genetic stuff and the current big project, we'll talk, talk about it a little bit, really is focused on those genetic effects, which is good. But in addition to that, there's also competition. There's ecological interactions between the hatchery strays and the wild individuals, but those aren't really that well known. The other issue is that hatchery strays can confound the escapement count, particularly if you can't tell who's who, right? So this is just a laundry list of some of these concerns, right? And then you have this other thing like things like potential impacts for MSC certification and other things. Okay, so what? All right, another one that people are starting to poke at a little bit. Is there something to it? Is there part of a story? So there's a postdoc that's working with me. This is for getting close to final uh, submission. Um, so what we compiled here is about 14 million records of size of Alaska salmon, sockeye, chinook, chum, and coho. Sadly, there's not a lot of great Across Alaska pink salmon size data, which is a shame. Um, and so what these data are showing across Alaska are some shared wiggles. Fish are getting smaller through time. And our best modeling efforts suggest that for some of these species, there is some effect of what looks to be competition in the ocean explaining some part of this size change. It's certainly not all of it. It's not even close to being a smoking gun. It's part of this, perhaps, the story. Okay? And I also asked this. And, and I think this also costs money. So, so what? So why does strain matter? And so I asked this question, leaning on data from the Hatchery Wild Project, and I said, well, you know, how much did strain, pinks, and chum, and Prince William actually cost harvesters during these years where they were able to reconstruct the total run of wild and hatchery fish in Prince William Sound? 
I think that's an interesting question. So if you look at that for chum salmon, there were 129,000 strays estimated to have occurred in those years. And if you take those numbers in those years and multiply it by the cost per estimated pound and do some sort of back of the envelope idea, that translates into something like $410,000 of lost revenue. Assuming you right? caught every fish, that's great. No. Yeah, but, but that's, that's what you would do with them, right? It doesn't go to cost recovery and it doesn't go to anything else. Clearly, you would catch those fish. If you're 100% so efficient. Yes. I guess fishermen are all 100% efficient. <laughs> well, some years you've got 99% of the fish being caught. Really? But the point is, that is lost revenue. They could have been caught. Right? And so for pink salmon, if you take this across these years, about 5.5 million strays, do the, the calculation of the price per pound, that's about four and a half million dollars of lost revenue. It doesn't go to harvest or go to cost recovery. So yes, is just a back of the envelope calculation, but there's one where I would hope to think there's some consensus of like, that's like right out of your pocket lost revenue that <coughs> seems to me to say, well, maybe, this is something we probably can't afford not to be looking at, right? There's money behind this. Okay, and it has led to, in part, right? That's why there's a lot of work going into this. And some of the studies, it seems like this is appropriate given that Prince William Sound Science Center is a major part of this. Asking these questions about things like what are the annual variation in strain in Prince William Sound? What are the fitness effects of strain? Um, and there's a lot of work going into this. So I'm going to steal some thunder from Kyle Shedd and Emily Lessack. Some emerging results from this project, right, where it's suggesting that hatchery and wild fish do differ in their success on the spawning ground. Okay? So this is the first year in one study. There's more coming, but this is just essentially just this value here is essentially saying that the hatchery fish on average have about 47% of the success of wild fish. In the females, curiously, in the males, they have about 87% of success of the wild males. And if you ask whether that's really a whole lot different than them being equal, you say, well, maybe statistically not. Okay, so it poses some really interesting contrasts, but it's suggesting that there's something different going on on the spawning grounds between hatchery and wild fish. Then this is another interesting one I thought that also totally indicates, you know, that hatchery and wild fish are interbreeding. So if you actually look at the cross types between the different offspring, that you can look and say, who were their parents? Well, there were individuals that had wild parent moms and wild parent dads, and they were crossed between those two groups. So they are interbreeding. So there's hatchery fish that have both hatchery parents, there's wild fish that have wild parents, and there's some in, that are interbreeding. So extra information coming out. Okay, and then I look at that and I say, well, that's well and good, but you know, what actually is the ecology of those strays? What's happening, what's mediating that different success? To me, that poses a whole lot of really interesting questions. And that's led to some work that some students have been doing. Uh, Casey McConnell finished his master's fairly recently, working on chum salmon um, strain ecology in Southeast Alaska. And Julia McMahon is currently working with me, um, part of sort of complementing the larger hatchery wild study. And so just some patterns of what Casey was finding and some similar things in Prince William Sound. So there's chum salmon from Alaska. So he found that wild and hatchery fish differ in their run timing, but still overlap in the streams. So what he found was that for an entry date, first the wild males came, and then the hatchery males and the wild females came, and the hatchery females came last. Uh -huh. Okay? So being last didn't help you too much. Huh? Okay. He also quantified individuals that died and had not spawned all of their eggs. So this is looking at what fraction of individuals had died and how, what fraction of eggs they had retained upon death. It goes up towards the end, right? Sort of consistent with competition. There's not as many sites to spawn in. Competition gets tough, so you're going to die and not spawn as many of your eggs. And overall, curiously, he found about half of the eggs were failed to be spawned of the hatchery fish compared to about 19% of the eggs by the wild fish. So the hatchery fish come later, don't spawn as many eggs. They still are spawning, but they don't spawn as many. And then what's the size difference? Are they the same size? In body size? Uh, yeah, body size of the female. Because okay. that affects the number of eggs. 
So in, um, I'm going to zip over to Prince William Sound a little bit. Okay, so these are Prince William Sound data. This is from um, Julia compiled these data for uh, Patty and Herb Creek. Even in odd years, these are pink salmon. So suggesting there are differences in different years and the different relationships between these groups oh, in nice. different years. So overall, pinks are much bigger in even years than odd years. And you have different relationships of through time of who's bigger than the other. Okay, so it's suggesting at least in this odd year that early in the season these hat the, the, the wild natural fish are much bigger than the hatchery fish, and then they sort of converge on each other through time. Okay, so there's just some really interesting patterns that suggest that at least in some years that hatchery and wild fish do differ in body size. Is that both sexes combined? There? It is. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. So my interpretation. What does this mean? This is my interpretation. So I say, you know, overall the conditions for pretty meaningful and potential interactions that might be detrimental from the perspective of the wild fish seem to be in place, okay? And for me, I'd say that's enough to be concerned to be looking at this. And I think that's why this big project is going on and there is this concern. But given that there's differences in size, there's differences in timing of these traits that we think really matter, and these are traits that we also know, at least a lot of them, have some genetic component. Those things are all right, essentially, to have those interactions that I think continuing to look at that makes sense and should be of concern. Okay, so I say, well, there's concern, but like, what do we do with that? Where to from here? So this is gonna be my plug of where to from here, okay? I'm gonna make the claim that these problems are too big to not work together. So I think building and strengthening relationships between industry, between researchers like myself, between the management, between NGOs as much as possible, I think it's really important to have these conversations, these honest conversations, have forums like this to talk about these things. I'm going to double down. I really think we're going to be stronger together working on these things. And I think we need to work together to explore the trade-offs associated with different choices associated with alternative scenarios of production, both of wild fish, because wild fish are increasing in numbers as well, right? And the hatchery component and explore what are these trade-offs, okay? The current study, unfortunately, I think is not gonna tell us a whole lot about what our options are moving forward, okay? I think we should explore to reduce both the rate of strain as much as we can, but also the numbers of hatchery strays going to make that argument about the money value. I mean, it's like the strays cost money. So let's reduce both the numbers and those rates. I think we can refine things like what we have control over, remote release locations, and acknowledge, we talked about this some, acknowledging that some sites seem to be more attractive to strays than others. So I have a student coming on, she's asking this question um, with data from Southeast Alaska Chum Salmon, hopefully working with some Prince William Sound data too to essentially say, okay, all else being equal, how can we explain why some sites tend to, year after year, have more strays than others? And if we get a better sense of that, that could, should help us inform where we might put some of these release, remote release locations, okay? And then ultimately, I think, continuing working towards, I think, a really clear legacy of ethical production of salmon for common property fisheries is where we need to go. I think this helps put us in that, in that path. So those are my ideas, just my ideas. Um, would love to have more conversation about that. But before that, um, just wanted to acknowledge not only you all sticking with me, that's longer than maybe I promised, um, but also want to acknowledge all the funding that has supported my lab. Industry, federal funding, state funding, private funding. Um, so I like to put that up there to show who supports the work of my, myself and my students. And I'm happy to have conversation now conversation later. Thank you. Later. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a rumor about reluctant fishermen. Maybe hopefully not all the beers been drunk at the reluctant fishermen yet. <laughs> yeah. Could you go all the way back to the pink salmon with all the tributaries on there? Maybe. Um, what I what I yeah. wondered was yeah. um, 
you know, Sam are going all the way up the Yukon. Oh, yeah. Clear into the construction bay. Yeah. Yeah, that's just an incredible display. Is it 400 miles or something? It's, um, it's some, it depends on how you calculate it. I mean, the whole, it's, it's nearing 2,000 miles. Okay. I'm still in it. All right. So you want to see that map on the fish? Yeah. That map? Yeah, that's great. This is on the internet. You might be able to download it. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's a salmon don't know borders one. There it is. It's it on that website then. Yeah. Until. That one. slide you had but that showed four species the, the declining size yeah um has that sped up over time the decline or it, is it <laughs> it suggested that and we talk about it there was a paper of, published on it back in 1998 by bigler at all yeah. so that's been known that's been known a long time from certain places yeah. And it really dipped in the 90s there, didn't it? So after, it, I mean, you could interpret this as that there's a acceleration maybe, right? But there's wiggles. It wiggles through time. And then some of those wiggles are shared, right? Ch overall, Chinook, when you look at proportion of change and consistency of change, um, Chinook has, well actually in some ways it consistently, the, the error around that suggests that there's different populations doing different things. Sockeye are actually quite consistent, but um, the shape of the decline for Chinook is more linear decline than some of these others. Chinook have changed a lot. And pinks are? Pinks are shocking, like, so this was, this is statewide, so this is not, you know, there are clearly some pink data in some years in some sites, but this was, we wanted to take a look across all of Alaska, so there's not great consistent pink size data across the state. A lot of also variability, there's some places here with large pink salmon that we trolled, I haven't seen them. Yeah. Then we've had a couple of years with small ones. But that big weird all paper from 98, I think it covered more than Alaska. But you can look, the, in the, I looked at the sockeye most closely, and looked at individual rivers, and you can see a periodicity within the river, especially the ones that have cyclic dominance. So you can kind of see a density dependence in that curve. But now you can see that in the 90s, there was a, especially between Sakai and Chum, they both dipped quite a bit, and yep. then they picked up again. So yep. you can see they, a little bit of a dip in the they share, And they too. share those dips. Yeah. And, and there is some, yeah. and if you do the simple correlation and line things up and say, wow, those are the years when there was lots of fish in the ocean, it lines up, but when you do the appropriate analytical, like statistical test to look at the effect sizes, it's part of the story, but it's not a huge smoking gun part of the story. That, that overall, we are able to capture, whether this is good or bad, but our best analytical methods, with a lot of time working on this, I assure you, we can explain up to about 50% of the variation. It means there's 50%, it means that there's Still, fifty percent of the story that we re I don't know what was going the PDO on. one of the uh, oh yeah 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 P a PDO and temperature and numbers and <laughs> solar cycles and whether butterfly flapped its wings and yeah I mean we looked at and and so it, what it's suggestive of is that you know there are multiple effects multiple drivers of small effects there's not a few numbers of really big drivers. It's multiple little things. And that's the way that the data is really suggesting for this story about size change. So anyone would say, oh, it's only because there's so many fish in the ocean. Well, the data doesn't play that out. It's part of the story, and the climate drivers is part of the story, but it's only part of it. Kyle? How much of the change in size and change in age composition? About 90%. So Kyle's point is this is average size for these species that have multiple age classes. Is that because fish have gotten smaller within an age, or because that are they younger and smaller, and so the average size is smaller? For all of these species, it's well, well over 80% approach to 90% is explained because there has been a shift in the age composition such that fish are returning 
at a younger age. There are also studies done on specific ages, and fish at age have also declined. The Chinook, there's some, several papers on Chinook as well as papers yep. on sockeye. So a three-year-old sockeye has gotten smaller. Yes, although seriously, some ocean. of the some of the younger Chinook had actually increased in size. So there's some curiosities, but clear this is driven by changes largely in age composition that manifests itself in total average size change. So from the perspective of a harvester or something, this is this is what you see, but it's driven largely by changes in age composition. Ooh, Baja tacos coming back. Yeah. So what are the what are the prevailing thoughts on what determines whether you come back at three or four or five? This is one of those proximate ultimate questions. <laughs> um, there is clearly relationships overall between growth rate and how large you are at certain thresholds. Size. So if you are growing really fast, there is a tendency to then mature young. So that's part of the story. But we also know that certain rivers, like, like the beaches, the beach sockeye, they tend to be comprised by more older fish that are larger. So that population has more older fish in it, presumably because being older and bigger gives you an advantage for reproduction, where if you are big and old in the little creek, you get eaten by a bear. So there's site-specific trade-offs associated with those things, but underpinning both of those are the relationship between growth rate and then the, dis the decision to mature. I've gone scuba diving that, where they're beach spawning. Yeah. I've gone scuba diving where they're beach spawning in Lake Eliana, and it was more of like a sand. And the sockeye looked really huge, but they were gi doing these giant pits. It must have been a Newton Bay. Yes, it was. Shocking. Okay. So, yeah. But it was just interesting. It looked like a, being a bigger fish, yeah. like a, having a bigger shovel, and to be yeah. able to scoop the sediment out. Mm. So there might be some advantages to being larger. Oh, for sure. And now the more recent like pedigree analysis, the reproductive success stuff, we've gotten to the point where deeper-bodied males actually have more kids. So I mean, we've gone beyond sort of like, hey, the big guy spends more time by the female. We've actually gotten to the, to the fitness consequences of those body shapes. And similarly, being a skinny little guy in a small stream is better than being big. So there's selection favoring those things in the different sites. That makes sense. Yeah. So what are the techniques that prevent the, to have the hatchery fish home better? Yeah. How do you Well, I look that's I think that was partly the 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 preface of starting with some of those like experiments that we started out with like the different chemicals or this, that there are other things that you might consider doing in terms of imprinting to certain compounds, thinking about the water chemistry, doing something to make the waters of the places you want the fish to home to be more distinctive, have more control over those, make them look different than the other sites, makes me think about something like those experiments. Yeah. There's also other work, and I, because I had way too much to talk about already, there's other ev evidence about the timing of releases and strategies of releases that can link to strain. So whether you volitionally release versus not volitionally release, the timing, the, so if you release really early, strain goes up. If you release really late, strain goes up. So there could be a timing effect that lends itself, I think, to experimentation. So those are the things that you have control over, right? That's what I think of. It's like, what do you have control over? Something about water chemistry, maybe. Timing of release, strategies of release. Um, and then the other one that comes to mind is that idea of the, the imprinting early in the life stage, the embryonic imprinting stage, right? Oh, yeah. That maybe you say, look, we want to have remote site location and have those fish not stray from those rem remote sites. So maybe we, early on in the life, imprint those groups that are destined to be released somewhere else to those locations earlier in their life. And they're actually doing that in the Columbia River for a strategy where they're trying to have fish spawn in the wild. So they're reared in a hatchery, but you want them to go to these small tributaries. So you imprint them early in life in that hatchery with just a little bit of their sort of off-site release location water, and it can increase their homing. So it lends to me things that we have control over experimentation. But you want to use an artificial scent. You want to use a scent that you can control. Absolutely. But you could also, the idea about the amino acid profiles, there's nothing to say that you couldn't create your own suite of amino acid profile for AFK versus Wally Nuremberg versus 
and you imprint them to that chemical bouquet. These are just ideas, but those are things that you could explore that are within our control. The question is, what can you put in the water? Uh, you mm -hmm. said that the, the fish make collectively, the strain rates less when they try and collectively higher abundance. Right, so rate goes down when the numbers are up. Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess just for a question, could that be due, say, the survival of the, for not as, uh, not as much of abundance, there's less of a chance of stray because conditions are favorable, and if there's less salmon in the ocean, maybe there's something to do with they don't want to go back to their stream because the survival was up high or something like that. Hmm. I, that was a question I thought. Was that asked when you were doing that research? Well, that specific question, that interpretation wasn't. Mm -hmm. I guess I would have to... That sounds like an over beer question. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, not sorry, it's a good question. <laughs> but <laughs> no, totally. I mean, what 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 really got me was essentially that that finding mm -hmm. was counter to what my naive idea would be is like, if there's lots of the idea is like if there's lots of fish in your home stream, mm -hmm. it's full of fish. Maybe you should go somewhere else because it's already full, and that was completely opposite to the pattern I found. It led me to try to understand it, which was a totally lucky meeting of my buddy now Andrew, who had used these social interaction, uh, interactions to explain these collective. So he had done for his PhD essentially something that had social behavior and it had the exact pattern that I was founding that led me to think about social interaction. Okay. Is it the only thing that might be explaining that? Probably not. But I'm going down the rabbit hole to think about the social <laughs> stuff a bit. And I think there might be something to it. Because we know they just travel in groups. They have to make decisions to split off from groups. There's, testing it is hard. Yeah. Um, but it's fun to think about. Yeah, if you would agree with the desire for that, I had to ask that. So no, I appreciate it. Yeah. And I was still serious about the beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was uh, curious is, uh, as abundance goes up, management uh, techniques in the prosecution of fish or change, uh, abundance, you know, tends to lead to more liberal uh, fishing time yeah. area, things like that. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if that may have uh, an impact in the Dexter's kind of I mean, it, it is, to me, I interpret as whatever the m mechanism by which the group sizes change, whether they're caught or whatever it is, could that have implications on the decisions of those fish that are in that group? It's like, so to me, I think, yeah, it probably could. I don't think I honestly have enough sense of exactly all of those subtleties of, and I don't think we know, I mean, where the groups are, who comprises those, those groups as they start interacting with fisheries and that kind of stuff in Prince William Sound. Um, I don't know those details, but it seems like it's things that you might be able to get at. Certainly probably could model um, so I don't have a great answer to your question. Yeah, and I was looking more at yeah. you know individual for smaller school yeah. sizes. I'm talking about you know returns of fish overall, like you know a large hatchery. Return. Oh, so are you actually saying oh so by catching lots of fish, there's fewer of them, so are we making the strain worse? Well, maybe maybe with hatchery with the, is the sense for hatchery strain. If, if there's yeah. a more aggressive fishery, yeah, and that tends to reduce the overall. It's true, yes, but again, like you have all of these conundrums. I mean, it's like, do you fish really hard in order to reduce the total numbers of potential fish that might become strays, but then also take into account an extra thing like, oh, if the numbers are smaller, the rate goes back up. I mean, I don't, I don't know how to, uh, you know, the reality is in those big years too, I mean, when there was a whole lot of fish and 99% of them were caught, a small potential rate of strain lead to a whole lot of numbers. So the, the rates and the numbers, I don't know how to answer your question. Things to think about. Um, to me, the almost obvious thing is to try to catch as many fish as you can. Right? The hammer approach. Well, so, and, there's, and, and from what I've seen, you're doing a pretty good job catching lots of fish, but you can't catch them all. You guys are really good harvesters, but you can't catch them all. Some are going to get away from you. Yeah. So.
Well, I'm going to give him a hand.